Extraction is a common technique used in the organic chemistry lab as a way to purify mixtures of compounds or separate mixtures of compounds. A lot of times we'll use an extractive process during a reaction workup procedure. And uh, when we say extraction, we mean liquid-liquid extraction. And we'll be mixing two liquid phases. So that would be an aqueous phase and an organic phase. And we typically use a uh, separatory funnel, such as this, also called a SEP funnel, as a way of conveniently mixing and then uh, removing the aqueous and organic layers. Now, when we are mixing uh, the aqueous and organic, what's going on is we are uh, the dissolved components are, are partitioning between the two phases, and certain components are going to have a preference for the aqueous phase, things that are very, very polar, things that are ionic for sure, would like to go to the aqueous phase, and most of our organic components are going to prefer the organic phase, although not completely. There will still be some amount of partitioning. There will usually be some dissolved in each, in each of the two phases. Okay, we can um, separate mixtures of compounds by using extraction by taking advantage of their reactivity, such as an acid-base extraction. If in the organic layer we had something, an acidic component that we wanted to remove, then we could wash it not just with water, but we could wash it with uh, sodium hydroxide or sodium bicarbonate solution. To, and that would react with the acidic component and make it an ionic salt and therefore draw it into the aqueous layer and out of the organic layer. So we would call um, the process of uh, doing extraction extracting if we are removing something that we want into a desired layer. And we refer to it as washing if the process is removing some unwanted material from our desired layer. So, uh, so sometimes those two terms are used um, uh, at different points. Let's talk a little bit about the SEP funnel. Uh, at the bottom here, we have uh, something that's called a stopcock. This is what, what starts and stops the flow of liquid coming through, draining through. And in this case, I have a Teflon stopcock. Uh, which is a little more convenient than the glass ones because the glass ones require a little bit of um, uh, grease, but if you have too much, then of course that can contaminate your sample. Okay, but you can take it completely out if you need to uh, wash it and clean it thoroughly. To reassemble it, we can put uh, the stopcock back in. There is a Teflon washer that goes against the glass. There is a rubber ring that goes between the two plastic piece pieces. And then there is a pl plastic, a blue um, nut here that goes on the end to hold it all together. Okay, and this is the part that you'll tighten to make sure it's, it's nice and firm when it's turning. But if you tighten it too much, it might be too hard to move. So somewhere where you can move it, but it's not too loose. Okay, and when you're done using a SEP funnel to let it dry out after it's clean, you can loosen that nut pretty far out and then kind of pop this out so this is freely flowing. So this is really the way that a SEP funnel should be stored and you need to keep that in mind because when you, you're ready to use a SEP funnel, you want to take a look at the stopcock and make sure you tighten it back up and get it in a, in a good position. Okay, I'm going to put it in the closed position here and uh, that's also very important so that when we introduce the liquid to it, it doesn't pour straight through. Uh, probably every single person you've ever talked to who's done an extraction at some point has accidentally uh, poured a liquid into an open uh, stopcock. So it's always a good idea to keep a flask under here as well, just in case you make that mistake. It's not going to be a huge mess. Um, and notice I've used, uh, I need some kind of support for my SEP funnel. And this works very well. It's just an iron ring with some pieces of rubber tubing that have been cut out so that it's gentle on the glass and um, we don't have metal on metal. You can also maybe use a larger ring with a clay triangle inside as a way to support the... It'll, it's a little harder to feed in there, but that will still work very well. What we don't want to do is, is clamp the SEP funnel to a ring stand because we're going to be needing to put it on and take it off very ra uh, very frequently so we want a convenient way of just for it to to rest like that. Okay so right now I have um, an ether solution that I would like to wash and so I'm going to make sure the stopcock is closed there's a container underneath just in case I'll use a, a funnel to help introduce it without spilling 
Okay, and I don't have any ether with me, but I really should rinse this a little bit with some fresh ether to make sure I transfer it all. Okay, and I'm going to be washing it with some water. And now when you're following an experimental procedure, it'll say something like, you know, wash with, with a 20 milliliter portion of, of water. Uh, and th those numbers are just approximate. You don't need to, to measure them out very precisely. Um, we just need an, an approximate volume. Okay, and when you see that I add that, you see that it forms two layers, of course, because um, one is organic and one is aqueous, and they do not um, mix very well. They do not uh, dissolve in each other. And <clears throat> most often, the organic layer is the one that's on top with most of our organic solvents, and I happen to have a colored compound dissolved in my organic layer today, so it's very easy for us to see the two layers. Um, and this is an ether solution. So yes, ether is less dense than water. It's going to be in the upper layer. Uh, but there are some organic solvents like methylene chloride or chloroform that it, the halogenated ones are in fact more dense than water. And so it's going to be the bottom layer. Okay, but if you're ever unsure if anything's a little tricky, you can always try just squirting in a little extra water and watching it and seeing that, you know, in this case it just dripped right down to the bottom layer so you can really confirm which is aqueous and which is organic by adding a little more of one solvent or the other. Okay, now I'm ready to mix these and in order to get them to partition I, I need to um, get a chance for these two layers to mix well so I'm going to place uh, the stopper on top here. I'm going to always secure the stopper uh, with my hand because as I mix these layers um, it's going to build up some pressure because our organic solvent is typically volatile and it's going to uh, vaporize and it's very easy if this is not secured that stopper will just pop right off and that would that would be a big mess okay in fact so much pressure can build up here that the glass can actually explode okay so we want to be very careful when we're mixing these we're going to invert it gently and we're going to very uh, frequently we're going to vent the mixture and allow any built up gases to escape. Okay, notice when I'm venting it, I'm pointing it away from myself. I'm not pointing it at any other uh, people in the lab. Okay, and when I'm ready to mix, I can mix it gently and then vent. And I can hear a, a slight little uh, escape of gas. And I'm going to continue mixing gently until there's not a real big um, release of gas when I, when I vent it and then I'm ready to shake more vigorously. Okay, we really want to get a good shaking there so that our compounds have a chance to partition. If you are, happen to be washing with sodium bicarbonate uh, as, as one of your extraction, as your aqueous layer, that's another example where it's, it's so important to vent because that's going to be releasing carbon dioxide and so um, we would expect a lot of bubbling with that and a lot of gas buildup. Now in this case we're getting a really good separation between our aqueous and our organic layer, okay? But sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes they do not separate very well, um, and that would be called getting an emulsion. So as you're beginning to mix this, you want to look to make sure that they're separating. If you see an emulsion building up, then we don't want to shake it very vigorously because that's going to make for a, a, a big mess that's going to be hard to separate. Okay, an emulsion um, is kind of like when you have salad dressing. Uh, has, has the oil and water components and you shake it up and then it stays in that mixed up state for a while. That's an emulsion and the reason it stays that way and doesn't separate right away is because it has things added to it that act as emulsifiers and keep that emulsion in place. And well it might be that the reaction that you're working on or the components that are dissolved also act as emulsifiers and so sometimes we get emulsions even when we're not um, you know, expecting them. So if you have an emulsion, uh, a lot of times just letting it sit, eventually the layers will separate. You can sit and just swirl it very gently periodically. You can maybe use a stir rod to, to, um, to maybe break up the layers a little bit. Um, adding some brine can help break up an emulsion or actually some salt crystals might do that. Okay, but if you have an emulsion that's really persistent, you might find that you need to filter it to get some insoluble uh, uh, components out of there. There's a few tools that you can, that you can um, resort to if you have an emulsion. Okay, well I'm finally done. Let's say our extraction process is done here, our washing process maybe. Uh, so we're ready to separate the two layers. So again, this is nice about the design of the SEP funnel is the stopcock just needs to be opened. And then whatever layers on the bottom will drain out first. 
and as it gets narrow, the volume becomes smaller and smaller so that I can watch very carefully and slow it down when the, when the organic layer gets real close and just let it drip through until finally all the aqueous is gone. One more drop. Okay, and now we're ready for, uh, to collect our organic layer and you might think, well, we can just pour this out now. The problem is the stopcock is now filled with, with the aqueous layer as is the, um, the neck here. So a better practice if, if, uh, if it works is you could just pour it from the top and that's going to minimize our contamination. We're never going to be completely able to separate the aqueous and the organic layers 100 percent. It's, it, it's very common to have a, a drop or so in each, but that's okay. And it's also common to do more than one extraction, more than one washing for just that reason. Remember it's a partition, so that first washing is going to get uh, a certain percentage of the contaminant out, that second washing is going to get even more, or, that, or those extractions. Okay, now again, because I have a colored component, it's very easy for me to remember which, which uh, flask is which here. Um, but it's always a good idea to label our, our different flasks. So I'm going to label this the organic, because this is my uh, ether layer. I'm going to label this aqueous. It's such a great idea to have a Sharpie marker in the lab, because it writes right on the glass and it uh, wipes off with acetone and so we don't have to worry about stickers or labels or, or notes or anything like that and uh, this way we're not going to mix things up. Throughout the course of, a, of an extraction you might end up with several different flasks and some can be combined and some can't but if they're all labeled then, then you're less likely to make a mistake and absolutely you want to hold on to all of your fractions until the reaction is totally done and you have your product in your hand uh, because if you inadvertently uh, you know, continue on with the wrong fraction or discard the wrong fraction once it's in the waste container, you can't get that back. So make sure things are well labeled and make sure they are, um, th that you hold on to them all until you're all done with your reaction. Okay, now let's take our organic layer and typically what we want to do now is remove the organic solvent and uh, so we can put this on a, a, something like a rotavap to evaporate the solvent in a, in a very rapid fashion. Okay, but remember this has just been exposed to an aqueous layer over here and water is somewhat uh, soluble in ether and ether is somewhat soluble in water so th we would describe this ether layer as being wet because it has some dissolved water in it so before we remove the ether we want to dry this ether layer uh, and when we use the term dry in an organic lab what we're talking about is removing the um, just removing the water from the organic layer so we have a number of drying agents. Um, this is calcium chloride. We can use something like magnesium sulfate or sodium sulfate. There's a variety here. Okay, but if you take a look at the organic layer, it looks kind of cloudy. Okay, sometimes you might even see some dr actual droplets of water in there. So clearly there's water present. It's a little cloudy, so that looks wet to me. And I, I'm sure it's wet to some extent, even if it looks dry. So I'm going to scoop in some calcium chloride. These are little little um, pellets and you can see that it, it actually has gotten clearer already and the calcium chloride balls that I've added in there have all kind of clumped up together and that's how they behave when they absorb water. They're very hygroscopic. In fact, now they're stuck to the flask. There is actually quite a bit of water in there and now I have a, just a solid mass of calcium chloride in there. So it's done a good job of drying but I can't be sure that it's done drying because it all ended up clumping together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another portion and I'm going to continue adding small portions of calcium chloride until finally the last portion I've added does not clump up. It remains freely flowing. Okay, the parts that are clumped are going to stay clumped but I want those last few ones to stay. And in fact, I still have them all clumping up. So let's add one more chunk. And then that's how we know we have a dry solution. We have, it, looks, it looks clear, uh, it should be homogeneous, and our drying agent is freely flowing. Okay, and then finally we're ready to filter off the drying agent. It's a good idea to let this sit for a while um, to make sure you have a, a, a appropriate amount of time to get rid of all the water. Okay, so let's assume we've, we've had that sit for five, 10 minutes. And now, uh, because I'm gonna be using a rotavap, 
I uh, want to transfer this into a round bottom flask, and I've already teared this round bottom flask, I meaning I've already taken its, its weight so that when I'm done with the Rotovap, I'll have my flask and I'll have my compound in there, and I can put this right on a balance and know exactly how much of my compound that I have. So I'll pour this into a teared flask. All we need to do is uh, gravity filtration because we are discarding what we're filtering off. We want to collect the uh, filtrate instead. And uh, I'm using a fluted filter paper, which I folded myself. And after I filter off my drying agent, then I'll have a nice, clean, uh, dry ether solution that's ready to go onto the Rotovap. I'll, I'll rinse this a little bit with some fresh ether so that I transfer all my compound in there and we're ready to go to the Rotovap.